All right, welcome back to Arcane Intelligence. You know we love to get a little arcane, and today we're diving into something legendary, something really spooky, the Necronomicon. Ah, yes. The Necronomicon. That grimoire that everyone whispers about. Yeah. The one that supposedly holds all the keys to Sumerian magic. Powerful stuff. Spells of incredible power. Right? Oh, absolutely. Well, we're going to unpack excerpts from not one, not two, but three Necronomicon-related texts. Woo. So get ready. And don't worry. If you're new to all of this, this philosophy and Western magic and all that, we're going to break it down. Easy to grasp. Yeah, I think people get really intimidated this kind of stuff. They do. It can get very complex. So we'll keep it nice and easy. Like we're cracking open a treasure chest okay. full of ancient secrets. That's a great way to put it. But you know, maybe wear some gloves just yeah. in case. Yeah. Good idea. You never know what you're going to find in there. Right. The Necronomicon, it's just shrouded in mystery, like a shadowy figure yeah. lurking in the back alleys of history. Okay. I like that. I like that visual a lot. Yeah. Always tempting us, right? With these glimpses of forbidden knowledge. Mm -hmm. and cosmic power. Yeah, forbidden knowledge, that's always the best kind. And the first text we're looking at really just throws us right into that world. The testimony of the mad Arab. This guy, he claims, to be the actual author of the Necronomicon. Oh, wow. But here's the thing. No one knows who he was or what happened to him. It's like he just vanished. Totally vanished. Mm. And his testimony is incomplete, almost like he was cut off. Mid-sentence. No, that's unsettling. Very unsettling. It's as if he was frantically trying to record everything he learned, knowing that, well, that time was running out. Yeah, like someone was chasing him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the things he describes, really unsettling. He talks about the secret ritual that he stumbled upon. What was it like? These chanting priests. And there's this glowing stone monument levitating in midair, the Weird. whole scene just drenched in dread. And power. Oh, yeah. Powerful. Otherworldly power. I bet. And, you know, he keeps mentioning this one word. Kutulia. It sounds like a name, yeah. but it just gives you this feeling of immense power. Yeah. And maybe malevolent power. Right. It's believed to be a powerful entity, this force of mm. cosmic chaos oh. and the mad Arab. He describes these symbols carved on that levitating stone. Three of them. Three. Yes. The first is ARA. It represents the link mm -hmm. between humanity and beings from beyond the stars. Okay, so aliens. Mm. I can think of it that way. The second symbol, AGA, also known as the elder sign. That's like a key. A key to what? To summoning the power of the elder gods. Ah, okay. So you don't want to lose that key. No, you definitely mm. don't. And then the third symbol, uh, Bandar, the sigil of the Watcher. Oh, we've heard about this guy. Yeah, the Watcher, yeah. this protective entity. Yeah. But invoking it improperly right. can have some really bad consequences. Uh oh. So you got to be careful. Very careful. Because these symbols. Right. They're not just pretty carvings, they represent forces mm. beyond our comprehension. Which they're dangerous. They can be. The Necronomicon suggests that they act as a sort of agreement, a cosmic agreement mm -hmm. between humanity, the Elder Gods and those beings from beyond the stars. Wow, like a peace treaty. Yeah, you could think of it that way, but messing with these symbols, it's like messing with the balance of the entire universe. Whoa, okay, so, so don't touch the symbols, got it. Mm -hmm. And speaking of balance, that brings us to the zone, these seven celestial bodies that were so important to the Sumerians. The sun, the moon, and the five visible planets. Right. And each one has its own set of attributes, a seal, a number, a color, an essence. Like celestial archetypes. Archetypes, okay. Each embodying different aspects of existence. Yeah. And wielding different powers. So like cosmic personalities. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Do you have an example? Sure, Nana, the goddess of love and war, associated with the number 15, and copper. Okay, interesting. Then there's Shamash, god of light and life linked to gold and fire. So like the opposite of Inanna. In some ways. Makes yeah. sense. What about a darker one? All right. Nurgle, the god of war. <laughs> And plague. Ooh, plague associated with iron, blood. And the number eight. So it's like, no. what kind of energy do you connect with? What's your cosmic vibe? Right, like a cosmic personality test. I love that. But these associations weren't just arbitrary. They were deeply connected to how the Sumerians saw the universe. Right, their cosmology. Exactly. So if you study them. You can start to understand how the cosmos works. Yeah, like the instruction manual to the universe? In a way, yes. So it's not just about knowing their names. It's about understanding their personalities. Their strengths 
their weaknesses. Almost like building relationships with them. Yeah. But on a cosmic scale. That's a great way to put it. And that's where summoning comes in. The Necronomicon has all these rituals and incantations for calling upon these entities. Right. But I'm guessing. Yay. It's not as easy as just saying, hey, Shamash, come over for a chat. No, definitely not. It requires a lot of respect. Preparation. And you have to understand the immense power you're dealing with. I bet. So what do you have to do? Well, the Necronomicon emphasizes the importance of rituals, symbols, even the tone of voice you use in the incantation. So it's all very specific. Very specific. It's like trying to tune into a specific radio frequency. I like that analogy. You need to get it just right to make that connection. And if you mess up. You might not like what you tune into. Okay, so you got to be careful. No shortcuts. Definitely not. And within these texts, there's mention of a powerful grimoire called the Book of Maklu. Another book. This one is supposed to have mm. really potent spells for banishing, burning, and binding evil spirits. Yeah. It's a whole other level of magical practice. So advanced magic? Yes, with rituals like the exorcism of the crown of Anu and the exorcism against Azagthoth. Just the names themselves. Uh. Sounds so powerful. Oh, yeah. Like something out of an epic movie. Yeah, but instead of swords and shields, you've got incantations and symbols. Exactly. And all this is happening in this other realm. It's a fascinating look at how the Sumerians saw the spirit world. So it's not just about getting rid of evil spirits. It's about understanding them. Navigating this complex spiritual ecosystem. Right, like a whole other world. Exactly. Okay, so we've met some pretty intimidating entities. But now we're going to meet a hero. A true champion of Sumerian mythology, Marduk. Ah, yes. A Lord. god who defeated the Ancient Ones and paved the way for the universe as we know it. Right. The Megan text describes this epic battle, how Marduk faced the monstrous Tiamat, Tiamat, the embodiment of primordial chaos. Oh, wow. He defeated her. And from her remains, he fashioned the cosmos. That's an amazing story. It's like... Order versus chaos, good versus evil. Yeah, classic thing. The battle between creation and destruction. But it really makes you think about the universe, always changing, always in flux, this constant dance between these opposing forces. Are we humans? We're right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of the dance floor. Exactly. And the Necronomicon suggests that the Ancient Ones, even though they were defeated, they're not really gone. Right, they're slumbering. Just waiting to make a comeback. Waiting for the right moment to return and unleash chaos. So it's like this cosmic horror story, but it might actually be true. That's what makes these myths so compelling. I know, they're not just stories. They reflect these eternal struggles that we all face. On a personal level and a cosmic level Absolutely. and to understand how to face these struggles. The Necronomicon introduces us to the 50 names of Marduk. 50 names. That's a lot of names. It is, but these aren't just nicknames, they're titles. Each one representing a specific aspect of Marduk's power and knowledge. Oh, okay. And they can be used in magical workings to call upon his aid. So it's like each name is a key to huh? a specific path. Can you give me some examples? Sure. Marduk itself is the most powerful name, reserved for really dire situations. So break glass in case of emergency. Exactly. Then there is Nem Tilaku. Okay. Associated with communicating okay. with the spirits of the abyss Whoa. and even raising the dead. That's pretty intense. It is. And then there's Asaru. Which governs plants and fertility. It can make even barren land flourish. So like a green thumb. But on a cosmic scale. I love it. So many possibilities. But all this power right. comes with responsibility. Absolutely. That's the message that keeps coming up. The Necronomicon is full of warnings about misusing these forces. It's not just about wielding power, it's about understanding the consequences. Exactly. So we've got these ancient Sumerian myths, terrifying entities, and this whole system of magic that's both alluring and dangerous. It's a lot to take in. It is, but there's so much more to explore. We're just scratching the surface. We've only just begun. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. To delve even deeper into the mysteries of the Necronomicon. The Necronomicon. Stay tuned. So we're talking about the central conflict, the one the Necronomicon keeps hinting at. This cosmic struggle between the Ancient Ones and the Elder Gods, this grand epic battle, you know, playing out on a scale, I mean, we can barely even comprehend it. Hmm. And we're right in the middle of it all. It's like one of those huge um, 
you know those epic fantasy series mm -hmm. where these like ancient forces are just like constantly vying for control and the fate of the world just hanging in the balance but this isn't just you know fiction right this is about real power real entities real consequences exactly and the necronomicon doesn't like shy away from those dangers i mean it paints a pretty bleak picture yeah of what could happen if those ancient ones were to return yeah it's like a cosmic horror story it is but one that might actually be true. That's the thing. Okay, so we've got all these symbols, these dangerous entities, and this cosmic war just like brewing in the background. What are we supposed to do with all of this? I mean, it's fascinating, but it's also kind of overwhelming. Well, that's where the practical aspects of the Necronomicon come into play, right? It's not just, you know, warnings and scary stories, but it gives us tools, tools to navigate this very dangerous landscape. Remember those incantations? They're not just random words. These are carefully crafted formulas designed to protect us from those negative forces and to help us channel specific energies. So it's like a, like a magical instruction manual. Yeah. But with very real world consequences. Exactly. Those mm -hmm. rituals, the incantations, they're all about establishing boundaries and asserting control. You know, like drawing a line in the sand and saying, nope, not today, evil forces. Makes you wonder, though, why would anyone even, like, risk messing with this stuff if it's so dangerous? What's the motivation? Well, for some, it might be that thirst for knowledge, right? Hmm. This desire to unlock the secrets of the universe, no matter the cost. They just gotta know. They just gotta know. Okay. For others, it might be a desperate need for protection, a way to, you know, ward off evil, fight back against enemies. So, like a double-edged sword. It is. The power to heal and harm, to protect, to destroy. It's all kind of wrapped up in one. The Necronomicon doesn't hide that duality. It presents magic as this powerful force that can be used for good or for evil, depending on the intentions of the person wielding it. So it's not the magic itself that's good or evil, it's the person using it. That's the key. It's a reminder, right, that we all have that potential for both darkness and light yeah. within us. And those choices we make, they determine which path we follow. I think the Necronomicon is really forcing us to confront that duality head on. I like that. Okay, so we've covered a lot. Ancient Sumerian myths, terrifying entities, and this system of magic that's, you know, super alluring, but also dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us like a quick recap of the key takeaways here? Sure. First, remember that idea of the covenant, that ancient agreement between humanity, the elder gods, and those mysterious beings from beyond the stars, right. maintaining the balance of that covenant, that's crucial. Okay. Second, remember the Zonai, those celestial bodies. They're not just pretty lights in the sky. They hold immense power and influence. And understanding their attributes, that's key to understanding how the cosmos works. Gotcha. And third, remember magic as presented in the Necronomicon. It's a double-edged sword. It demands respect, preparation and a really clear understanding of what you're getting yourself into so awareness respect and responsibility you got it got it yeah okay but with all the warnings and like all the dark stuff we've been talking about yeah. there must be some hope right i mean there's got to be a reason why people keep coming back to these texts you're right there is hope the necronomicon isn't all doom and gloom i mean it acknowledges that evil exists <laughs> but it also points towards a path a path of knowledge and power that can be used to combat that darkness so even in like the darkest night there's always that glimmer of light exactly a chance for things to get better think about marduk the champion right he defeated the ancient ones he represents the triumph of creation over chaos, the potential for good to overcome evil. And then there are the elder gods themselves, constantly working to maintain that balance and protect humanity from the forces that would seek to destroy us. Yeah, even that, um, even the Watcher, as scary as he sounds, can be a powerful ally, right? If you approach him with respect and you know yeah. what you're doing. So it's like, even in the face of like overwhelming odds, there are these forces out there fighting for us fighting for a better outcome. The Necronomicon isn't about succumbing to fear. It's about empowering ourselves, about harnessing the forces of good to protect ourselves and those around us. It's a call to action, really. A challenge to like rise above our fears and embrace our potential to make a difference. I like that. Yeah. That's actually pretty inspiring. Okay, so we've got this mix of ancient myths, terrifying entities, cosmic battles, and you know the potential for great power and great danger. But where do we, like as individuals, fit into all of this? How do we make sense of it all and maybe even find our own place in this whole like cosmic dance? That's a great question. 
and one that we'll explore further when we return for the final part of our deep dive into the Necronomicon. So it's like we've been on this wild tour through ancient Sumeria, right? Yeah. We're like peeking into all these hidden temples, deciphering these like cryptic texts. And now we're left with all these pieces of this cosmic puzzle. We're trying to figure out how it all you know, fits together. The Necronomicon really does challenge us, doesn't it? It does. It challenges our understanding of the world, and it suggests that reality is far more complex, far more interconnected than we often realize. Yeah, for sure. And it reminds us that, you know, knowledge is power, but that power comes with, like, a big responsibility. Yeah. It's not enough to just, like, memorize incantations or try to summon these entities. It's about understanding the like the underlying principles, respecting well, that delicate balance yeah. that holds everything together. The Necronomicon really highlights that interconnectedness, doesn't it, of everything, right. the celestial, the earthly, the human, the divine. It's all woven together, this like intricate tapestry of existence. So it's not just about us. No. Our choices, our actions, they like they ripple out. They do. Affecting this whole cosmic web. It's a humbling thought. It is. And an empowering one too. We have the potential to make a difference to choose a path of light and contribute to that, you know, ongoing struggle against the forces of darkness. Okay, so someone's listening to this and they're thinking, wow, this is like totally fascinating. But where do I even, you know, begin? What advice would you give someone who's just starting to, you know, explore these ideas? I think first and foremost, approach these texts with respect and caution. Don't treat it like a game, you know, or, or a quick fix. Right. This is about embarking on a journey, a journey of self-discovery, spiritual exploration. So dive deep, not just like skim the surface. Exactly. And remember, knowledge is best absorbed gradually. Start with the basics. Mm. Build a strong foundation before venturing into the, you know, more complex aspects. Yeah, it's like learning a new language, right? It is. You wouldn't jump straight into reading like complex literature. Oh. You'd start with the alphabet basic grammar. Right. The building blocks. And trust your intuition. Not every concept, not every ritual is going to resonate with you. And that's okay. Focus on what feels right for mm. your own, you know, your own path. So it's about finding your own unique way, your own expression of, you know, magic and spirituality. Exactly. And remember, you're not alone on this journey. There are communities out there, resources to support you, connect with like-minded people, share knowledge, Learn from each other's experiences. Yeah, build that network, that support system. It's a complex, often challenging terrain to navigate. For sure. And never stop questioning. The Necronomicon is full of mysteries, layers of meaning. There's always something new to discover. So keep that sense of wonder alive, that thirst for knowledge, that drive to explore the unknown. I think the Necronomicon, it's more than just a grimoire, really. It's a mirror reflecting our own potential for both darkness and light. I like that. It challenges us to confront our shadows, to embrace our power, and choose a path towards understanding, mm. towards enlightenment. Wow. Well, that was quite the journey. We delved into the depths of the Necronomicon, explored those ancient Sumerian myths, you know, met some pretty terrifying entities, and glimpsed that incredible power of magic. But we also uncovered a message of hope, a reminder that we have the power to choose our path to make a difference in this cosmic dance. And if you want to keep exploring the mysteries of the arcane and the unknown, be sure to like and subscribe to Arcane Intelligence for more deep dives into the world of magic, mythology, and the mysteries that lie beyond. Until next time, keep seeking, keep questioning, and keep that flame of curiosity burning bright.